Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the March 6, 2023 meeting of the Ben Store Ben Review Board. Uh, we're calling the meeting to order at 702 this evening. Uh, just as a, a, a precursor, we all uh, met as per the agenda at 4 p.m. Uh, this afternoon to do site visits of some of the items that were on the agenda tonight. We went from four to seven, we saw about four or five sites. We closed the meeting for that public hearing, and we are reconvening now at 7 p.m. So, Planner um, Advisor, would you please connect roll call? Yes. Board Member Roth? Present. Board Member Kaplan? Present. Board Member Saunders? Present. Board Member Ohm? Here. And Board Member Beth? Here. Thank you. All in attendance. And if I may, yes, sir, I'd like to introduce uh, the staff that's here today. We have Director Julie Craw, myself, Mark Kleiser, Planner Stephen Schweitzer, um, Planner Jesse Waldman, and Code Enforcement, Richard McLaughlin. And thank you all staff for being here and supporting us. I greatly appreciate it. So, uh, agenda number three uh, is proper notice to establish. Yes, proper notice to establish. Thank you. Uh, brings us to number four, which is approval of minutes. So these are from the March, I'm sorry, the February meeting. That's correct. Uh, we had a uh, board member Kapler. Review and thank you for your fastidious review. Um, I went through and I started marking mine up to for your uh, uh, that is. Okay. Um, I believe you provided. I've given them a copy of my comments. Yes. Okay. Um, I have a quick question for you on 9 8, the third item we have. 9 8, page 3, line 8, replace water tower with 5 lift. I was trying to figure out exactly which. Since that was, is that where we review board members, Kaplan and Palm, suggesting closing the open structure by cladding the exterior of the unit? Is that what you meant? I think my, my comment was to the effect that uh, the, the lift should be cladded, not the whole tower. Okay. So that, that was a sense where you wanted water tower to be replaced by a flood. Right. Okay. Wasn't quite sure, so I got that one. That's right. So is no, you received Holmes edits? No. Okay. So uh, for, for Holmes uh, comments, go ahead, I'll let you. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'll just run through them quickly. Yes, please. The, the first comment is just with regard to the fact that your Lambs First name was misspelled three times, um, and then uh, under nine uh, A review board discussion, first sentence. Uh, the first uh, first sentence where it says describe. I thought uh, a better word here would was uh, review board member sympathize with the applicant's concern rather than describe what the applicant's concern. And, uh, uh, and, that, is that accurate? and on the next page there was uh, the replacement of the word water tower by lift. And uh, then under 9C, uh, where we're talking about review board action, um, at, at least the way I remember it, uh, uh, we agreed to have the to have planning and building services come back to the review board with a memo outlining how the, the, the heaters uh, at the Mac House were going to be raised and possibly shielded, and the review board would have to approve the solution before planning and building <coughs> services would issue a new building permit, I thought. Those two sentences should be added at the end of review board action. Um, and under 9D, uh, I think there's a word missing after, after 
under presenters at the end um, advocated for the proposed I thought the project should be added there. And that's it. Thank you. I did not get the They were not sent the packet. Oh, we had to drop the yeah, you, you, you can abstain if you want. It's not high price. Any other uh, changes, thoughts, issues, comments? If not, I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the draft meeting. I'll make a motion to approve the draft minutes as a minute. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you. Roll call, please. Uh, board Member Roth? Aye. Board Member with, with, the, uh, with the amendments. Board Member Madgeville? Yes. Board Member Ohm? Yes. Board Member Saunders? Yes. And Board Member Ohm? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. to agenda item number five. Uh, have we had any correspondence from items not on the agenda? We are not. Uh, I'm under six report from the chair. Uh, I just want to welcome everyone back. It's nice to have a live audience and a full, and a full board. Um, no complaints, no issues. Thank you, staff, for showing. And I just want everyone to drive safely on their way back to you, kind of people. I think it's nice. Um, and thank you for all bearing with us. Uh, item number six. Seven public expression. Is there anyone wishing to speak on any item not on the agenda? Mr. Sachs, please come to the podium, state your name for the record, and realize that we do have a three minute limitation. Please direct all your comments to the chair. Please. For the record, my name is Rick Sachs, and over the years, I used to see one representative from planning that would be here conducting this meeting, and then occasionally an assistant. And uh, I understand that the price people pay for permits is determined by how much it costs to process it. And I'm assuming that with five people from planning here, that they're all getting paid and getting paid travel time. And that price would be going into the application fees for people. And uh, I question it. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, having, have, having more, I'm just going to do a quick response than I usually don't. Uh, having worked in the public sector for many different cities and counties in the past, uh, what typically happens is after the facts, the department will do a fee study and then look at the number of hours put in and we'll readjust fees accordingly. So that's that's right. Understood. I saw another hand up here. And state your name for the record and uh, please uh, keep your comments to three minutes or less. Todd Newberger. Um, very briefly, I would love to see the continuation of Zoom or the ability to do these meetings live from I would see my own home or office, and so um, my client. So I encourage you to kind of put that in motion and keep it up. Thank you. Thank you. And once again, I'll respond. Um, while we were at Zoom, we all had this uh, difficulty of trying to maintain the connection point between our constituents or the staff. Uh, when we were approaching having to come back in person, uh, there was a request from many of the board members to staff to allow for that to happen. Uh, the facilities we are in are not owned by the county, they're not controlled by the county. Uh, that being said, we're still encouraging and actually just had a conversation with staff about 10 minutes ago requesting the same thing. That there's some way we can get the ability to provide those who can't make it in attendance to be able to do it by Zoom, it's encouraging. And we're encouraging it still to see if there's abilities to do that. It's just it's a question. The logistics are 
putting equipment in the facility that the county doesn't own and maintaining it is it's a challenge. But um, that being said, I believe all of the board members would like the same thing, and we are trying to work with staff to move that forward. Thank you. Anyone else comment on any item that is not on the agenda or comment on anything that's not on the agenda? Hearing none, we'll move forward. Uh, this brings us to item number 11A. Uh, we have moved this item ahead because of time restrictions and trying to make the best use of our tax dollars. Uh, this is code enforcement for the town of Mendocino, their activity report. Um, Firefighter, can you please introduce the item and code enforcement staff? Yes, uh, this is the first quarterly code enforcement activity report for the town of Mendocino. The next one will take place at the June 5th, 2023, MHRB meeting. And Supervising Code Enforcement Officer Gresham McLaughlin will present today's report. Good evening, Board and staff and community members. I am Supervising Code Enforcement Officer Gretchen McLaughlin. Um, I just wanted to provide you guys an update from the last uh, report I provided you all at the September 12th, uh, 2022 meeting. Um, we weren't able to provide a report back on December 5th. Um, so this is going to be kind of a two-part summary of what the overall complaints for the entire year of 2022 were due to the limited meeting times that we have throughout the year, um, as well as the Section 2 uh, component will incorporate any complaints that we received in 2023 as of the time when I uh, drafted this report, which was on February 3rd, 2023. Um, so since uh, January 1st of 2022, we received an overall number of complaints of 34 complaints within the historical district. Of those 34, 22, the complaints were closed um, with 12 remaining uh, still, still under investigation at various levels, whether it needs termination or we're working with uh, property owners to resolve the matters and, and so forth. Um, so for the Section 1 complaints under the 2022 overall complaints within the Historic District, we received six complaints related to driveway or grading. And as you'll note, um, these were actually related to the same complaint um, from the beginning of the year where five of them came in for the same location in the 45,000 block of Little Lake Street. And um, that uh, complaint itself was actually, uh, has since been addressed with MHRB 2022-0007 uh, being approved uh, pertaining to the grading driveway encroachment. Um, beyond that, an additional complaint kind of snuck in towards the, the conclusion of the year regarding security cameras and bright lights, which we are currently working with planning staff to resolve that. Um, we also had a, a number of signed complaints, a total of five uh, within the town. Um, all signage violations have been removed at these locations and the complaints were closed. Uh, but we have one additional one that was received for the 44,000 block of Main Street, and it was also closed due to a previous MHRB approval for the current signage. Uh, regarding travel trailers and RVs, a total of three complaints were received related to the parking of RV and travel trailers. Two were closed due to them being parked on public roadways. Our zoning ordinance does not apply to public right-of-ways. Uh, additionally, uh, one uh, was removed from private property upon uh, code enforcement's request uh, in relation to the ordinances uh, associated with the town. For windows, we had a total of four complaints received uh, related to installation, installation or alterations of windows without the approval of MHRB. Uh, all four complaints are currently under investigation. Uh, meaning that we are assessing for permit requirements for the alterations as well as any requirements that don't necessarily, well, any requirements under MHRB or the fact that maybe it's used, utilizing material that's just simply not allowed. So we are working with the property owners on that. Uh, vegetation removal. 
A total of three complaints were received related to vegetation removal. Two were determined to be unfounded for the same location uh, as they just didn't qualify for the staff's definition. Um, as well as uh, one new complaint is currently under review for investigation, uh, which came in towards the end of uh, 2022. Can I ask about this? What are we talking about here? People complaining about trees being removed or what? Yeah, so so we every once in a while we'll get um, complaints regarding vegetation removal that um, especially when it comes to like anywhere that's considered or concerned to be an environmentally sensitive habitat or because we're also still kind of in the coastal zone as well. Um, I think a lot of people uh, just assume that that uh, major vegetation removal also applies. And so depending on the circumstances, we just have it reviewed by staff to determine if it's a violation. So can you enlighten us as to what types of vegetation are protected and which are not? It's not so much specifically what type of vegetation. Um, it really just falls within a definition determined by um, our ordinances. And usually it's like a number of trees or a certain percentage for that specific lot, along with any type of components involving environmental sensitive habitats and the types of removals and stuff, which is often um, uh, reviewed by the director and determined by the like If you're doing you know, vegetation removal in a lot, or something like that. Okay. Yeah. Is, is it limited to native? Is there differentiation between native and non native within the code? No. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. Any good one? Okay. Proceed, please. Thank you. All righty. Um, so, then we, I think I was on vacation rentals. Yes. Okay. So a total of three complaints were received related to non-permitted vacation rentals and operating a business without a license located at the same location in the 45,000 block of Ukiah Street. Two of these complaints were closed out as duplicates, um, and then one remaining complaint is pending uh, completion of an investigation. And I believe since then uh, we've gotten them to at least remove the listing and we're working it out to making sure that they understand what the ordinances are related to that. Okay, roadway encroachments. A total of two complaints were received related to barrels uh, being placed in the public right of way. Um, and again, this is one of those things that uh, because it's on a public right of way, code enforcement cannot regulate that from a zoning component. So we referred it to Department of Transportation through the county to do their, their enforcement of that because that's their jurisdiction. Okay, and then fences, a total of two complaints were received related to fence alterations or fences exceeding height limits located in the 1000 block of Cato Street and 4400 block of Cato Cotton Street. Both complaints are currently under investigation. Um, and a lot of that will kind of pertain to uh, checking to see what was uh, originally there, seeing what the alterations were, seeing if it's like for like, or if it's a new build, and then working with the property owners to address that through MHRP or get it to the exempt amount. Uh, displays. A total of one complaint was received related to displays of more than two items. Um, for sale um, in the 45,000 block of Little Lake Street, and that one is currently under investigation. Meters, a, two, a total of two complaints were received for exposed meters uh, located in the 45,000 block of Quito Street and 45,000 block of Coppola Street. These are currently under investigation, and we are working with the planning division to get a formal determination on, on how those are regulated. Quick question on that. Yes. When you say exposed meters, is that like a water meter or a gas meter or what? Gas meters. And those are required. Or actually, I'm sorry. Okay. My apologies. Electric meters. And those are required to be screened from public view. Is that correct? Yeah. I would be deferring to the planning division on that. But that's correct. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, and then residents, um, this one was kind of an interesting one. Uh, it's technically in the historic district zone B area, so that's why it's on this report. 
Um, it's not visible from uh, Zone A, but uh, it involves a non-permitted residence that was constructed on Crestwood Drive. Um, and that one we are currently working with the California Coastal Commission to resolve because they are the ones that actually approved the, the permitting for that one. So we're kind of working that one out with them. And then uh, vehicle parking, a total of one complaint was received related to multiple non-operable vehicles parked partially in the public right-of-way in the 44,000 block of Main Street, and that complaint is still currently under investigation. And then uh, light pollution, uh, one complaint was received uh, related to light pollution, um, where the light was actually emanating from inside the home to the outside of the home and staff determined that there uh, is no NCC ordinance that can be enforced regarding interior lights in that sense. And then for section two, at the time of the writing of this document, there was actually only one complaint for 2023, and that was also associated with the vacation rental noted for the previous year, and that one, as I said, we were working with the property owner to resolve that one.
So um, we have many that may be able to remain to be permitted, but they do have to come through and get that full permitting. We'll be review as appropriate, uh, planning the discretionary permits, and meet the required code standards in terms of setbacks, et cetera. Including environmental health? Yes. And potentially chemical, hopefully MCCSD as another governing agency? Yes. So uh, from my experience on the board, I know that someone like McCallum House, who puts up a tent for weddings, has come before this body on an annual basis. And I believe the second time they came up, I said, this is silly, let's do it for five years. But the procedure is that someone who wants to erect a temporary tent comes before building, planning building, and HRP, right. and gets approval. Yes. So from what I understand is that the jury's still out as to how long these tents can stand as such. Correct, yeah. So my like my assumption is that it could very well be that the date is terminated on February 28th, but like I said, there's still a 30-day period that allows folks that opportunity to remove those tents or to apply for the proper permit. Okay. So uh, a request from the chair, can we get an update on Exact status for next meeting. Absolutely. So we can make it very crystal clear to all of those in the community. But yes, uh, there would also be a press release coming out from our office because obviously it will affect more than just the town here. We want to make sure everybody is hearing that information. Uh, and folks have been aware that throughout this entire COVID process, they could have come through and obtained full permanent authorization for those temporary modifications. And then just as a, a step beyond, if there's a business or personal entity that has erected a tent during this time and they want to maintain that as a permanent structure, they have the ability to go or propose an application for a permanent design, maybe not a tent, maybe a greenhouse structure or something outside that could also meet planning building requirements. Yes, correct. And so when we get the when we get the more detailed update, could we also get a summary for those of us who are new as to what happened prior to the pandemic with tents, like the MacCab situation, or you know, like what was the previous procedure? Yeah, or the like if someone had a wedding previously, were they required to do the same thing, or is it now more? Say you're working with the, the people, what exactly does that look like? Are you sending them letters and they're tossing in the garbage or are you knocking on their door? Or what does it look like? So uh, for this particular one, we've, we've been communicating with the property owners on what it looks like to get into compliance. So uh, part of it with the vacation rentals um, under the circumstances is that we've been telling them to to demonstrate evidence that they are no longer offering them for um, for like you know short-term rentals and stuff like that. So um, unfortunately, with this particular one, I don't know if the outcome. It may be already closed at this point, and they may have already abided by what we required them to do, which is basically demonstrate that they no longer are operating a vacation home rental. More interested in the people who say, you know, you come and knock on their door and say, hey, this is illegal, and they say, hey, get, you know, pound dirt. What what teeth do you have to really stop these people? Yeah, so we uh, can, um, if, usually we always try to aim for voluntary compliance first. So we right. try to encourage the person to just work with what we're requiring, and we give them the applicable codes that demonstrate why they can't do the activity that they're doing. Um, if they are not willing to voluntarily comply, what we'll, we'll do is give them a notice of violation, which is a formal action that code enforcement takes to move the process forward to some type of more formalized um, action where it's like some type of punitive 
kind of consequence, right? So it could be uh, 30 days until you have 30 days to resolve this violation by either doing A, legalize it, or B, you know, remove it or cease the use or whatever the circumstance, depending on the violation. Uh, if they fail to do that after the 30 days of the time frame that we give them, 30 days is our standard for notices of violations. Uh, they can either receive an administrative citation for zoning, it's like $100 for the first time, uh, one day penalty, one time penalty, um, and then it kind of can go up from there. The second citation goes up, and then the third citation, they can go into daily fines. Um, another alternative that we do is um, we can place a lien on the property. Might not be the most appropriate for the circumstances of the vacation rental, but we do have avenues to, to cease the use. Thank you. Yeah. Board members, any questions of staff? Any more from the public? Thank you. Thank you much for your report. I look forward to hearing from you accordingly. Thank you, and I just want to express my appreciation for you moving this item up. I really appreciate it. <laughs> no, no need for uh, adverse and insane punishment for everyone. Excuse myself. Thank you. Thank you. Brings us to agenda item number 11B request for guidance draft policy regarding minor alterations in town of Mendocino with case study examples for naming HRB. Uh, Application 2020-0007, Jonada. Uh, uh, Louis uh, Feiner Schweitzer will be presenting. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chair Roth. Uh, let's start with a brief background here. Uh, given recent community interest and disruptions to the supply chain operations, staff finds that a minor alteration policy would be a responsive and beneficial approach towards preserving the architecture and character of the historic district. Uh, currently, alterations to issued MHRB permits are returned to the approving body for consideration. Uh, Mendocino County Code Chapter 2760 provides that alterations are subject to securing an MHRB permit and review board approval. Uh, to address these issues and to provide a distinction between minor and major <coughs> alterations, staff provides a draft policy and case study for consideration and review. The policy as proposed will allow the planning department to review whether minor alterations are consistent with the intent of and are in substantial conformance with an effective MHRB permit. As proposed, the procedure will occur uh, prior to building permit issuance and building permit amendments. Staff will prepare a determination for MHRB consent calendar approval. Uh, ideally, this policy is going to address any construction or supply chain uh, disruptions while still allowing the review for the final approval and say on designs. Uh, the case study example from previously approved MHRB permit 2020-007 uh, approved a shingle exterior siding on the western, southern, and eastern elevation facades um, of the proposed uh, structure as well as a patio door located to the right of the structure. Uh, as we saw on our slide visit earlier today, the structure has minor changes uh, to this pre-approved design with the following. Board and batten siding now replaces what was previously approved with the shingles um, and the addition of a decorative door as well as a relocation of the eastern working door from the right to the left. Uh, staff is recommending two recommendations, or requesting, should I say, recommendations. One, uh, to provide direction of the scope of the suggested policy and the procedure, as well as provide direction on whether the modifications uh, to the previously approved MHRB permit 2020-007 harmonize with other historic resources in the district, and the other <coughs> modifications do not detract from the appearance of other property within the district. So, in, in rephrasing all that, and make sure the permit comes in, board approves it, contractor and client executes that along the way because this that and other things, subtle changes happen that make it so that what you propose is not actually what is built, correct? And then what you're bringing forth us is how do we remedy that? Yes. Is that correct? Yes. So I know your big question, 
two had was that one is there is within your proposal. So the first thing is you, I guess, what you're saying is that you want staff wants the ability to synthesize the, the differences between what was proposed and what was executed and make that a consent item for us going forward. Correct. Correct. Board Member Magical is going to ask, is there a fee for that? Right. Sure. My concern is that small changes that happen, like for example, we have something I'm concerned about, changes, paint color changes, you know, everything is structurally the same, they're under the historical thing, like, I would be interested in not you know, not reassessing a permit fee since you know the finalization process is part of what they initially paid for. So I could see this going two different routes. Um, one with this being roped into some of the condition language moving forward. Um, historically, no pun intended here, uh, with our condition language number five, it's pretty restrictive for the applicant to you know come back and. Uh, secure a final, um, you know, site visit from planning to make sure that the permit was completed to you know, what was approved. Um, you know, changing some of the condition language moving forward could address that, and maybe that could, you know, negate not having to rope in an additional fee. Um, you know, our fee schedule is governed by the board of supervisors. Uh, we do prepare, you know, some studies for other changes in staff time uh, mm -hmm. and other items that, you know, may cause an increase in fees. We do have kind of a little catch-all um, for a zoning letter, um, so that fee could possibly apply to a, a process of this nature, um, and that captures, um, you know, staff time for preparing, say, a letter for review. Is this the same for uh, number five if it, it, it expires, right? So if it right. expires, and you don't get your final. Yeah, that's sort of separate in my mind. My, right. my, what I'm thinking of is in the, in the act of construction, we have a small change that the proposal would do that staff would have some lenience to say this is in keeping with, with the intent. Yes, the window is six inches lower. I'm sorry, that was a problem for mine. But that that would require an additional permit fee. Yes. And, and, and I believe, as you had mentioned earlier, that that would be a typical procedure for doing a final on the permit. So there really is not any additional work on staff that you would be doing otherwise. It's just that in terms of process and procedure, we would have a vehicle where we could sign off on it on a consent calendar and just let it go. Correct. So would there is part of this request or proposal to have a separate fee for this situation? No. no. Okay. Uh, if I may chime in where a fee may become applicable is say we bring forward uh, what we believe could be a you know, minor exterior alteration and the review board disagrees and says no this is a significant change that needs to go back for further analysis in which case that process would result in essentially a new permit being filed so under the current um, program those folks over on calcola did they have to file another permit application for those modifications that we just looked at no okay this, this is our guinea pig so, so i think they want they want two things under the recommendations one is to provide direction and to to make a call on this specific case. Right? Is that correct? Yes. We thought this was a prime example of something that, at least the staff's opinion, would be eligible for such as like a minor alteration coming forward on consent calendar for essentially a confirmation that yes, staff is correct. This is consistent with the town. So, question, which yes. is that? So, this is a this is sort of a case study. Yes. Which I think is good. But this isn't the official. I mean, I don't want to coordinate. This is not the official how we're going to do a procedure from how we're going to do it from here on out. Or is it? So, this is like a little two pronged thing. So, we're bringing forward this case study that I would like to get a determination on uh, today, as well as fleshing out what this policy and procedure would look like moving forward. Okay, and then so, we'll look at that. Right. For like so, I just thought, you know, this would be a great yeah, okay. example for, uh, you know, I feel like it's pretty applicable for the policy and procedure here. So, 
Uh, so would you be coming back to the board with formal language that would be a code augmentation for future policy? So where is this it? So if you look on the second page after that cover memo, there's a draft policy document there.
Mr. Grimes. Uh, can you please come to the podium and make your presentation? We'll, we'll take care of the specific application and see if it fits within this context, and then we'll take your policy after that as a broader overall. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Steve and, and the rest of the staff that you know, put together this policy. They've listened to me raising a stink because when Julie and Terry, what you're missing here, um, Board Member McAdol, is item number five on the standard conditions is all about uh, when we finish our project, we need to call up planning and building, and Julie and Terry comes down and makes a site visit to make sure that we abide by everything that you guys passed. Okay? And when she went to the Oneida garage, she said, this isn't even close to what was passed. You need to fill out a new application, go back to the board. I raised the state. They now have a policy. This policy, uh, I, do, I would not support this policy. I never support stuff when it takes away control from you guys. You should not give control of projects to the staff and let them determine whether a change is minor or major. You should keep it here. I think what happened tonight with the Yonated Garage is exactly what I suggested should have happened. You guys should go, you should be part of the final site visit. Because you have to be on a chair, you go to the final site visit. As HB will tell you, every construction project has changes throughout the process. And there's no way to come back here. So when Wind Spirit says, hey, I'm going to reuse some of the siding, I'm going to put it around the front, I say, fantastic. There's nothing we can do. There's nothing. We have to come back and pay a new fee and come back to a new presentation. And that's wrong. There should be a five-minute spot at the beginning of the meeting that during construction, if you want to change your paint color, you should be able to step up and say, hey, we decided to go with rose instead of white or whatever. It should not cost $918. And I raised this thing, so now we have a policy that we can make minor changes and the, and the staff up at the county can approve that. Unfortunately, the project that they used as a mechanical would not have sufficed. If you look at their policy, um, there's number number two on the policy says minor alterations will only be approved prior to issuance of a building permit or building permit amendment. Field changes during construction are excluded. So this policy would not have been approved, would not have been applicable to this project. So I still would have been asked by Juliana Cherry. So for that new application, I'm back here for the review board. So I, I think that what happened today was exactly what should happen. You guys should go part of your site visits every Monday or every meeting. You know, you go to the old projects when Deborah Lennox finishes that house. You know, you guys should be able to go out there and see it and see the fruits of your labor, see that, hey, you made the right decisions. And she should be able to come here during construction and for before you have right after public expression, she should be able to say, hey, we decided to change the railing or we decided to change this. It could be a very clear, concise presentation. And you could say, yeah, that's good. Or, oh my God, those are huge changes. You need to go back. But to have a policy that takes away power from you people and gives it to the staff at the county is bad, bad, bad. So, um, but I do support passing that garage. It is <laughs> outstanding. Yeah. So that's actually just why I called you up. Can you talk to the project? Well, yeah, the project is fantastic. I mean, you know, that is exactly what we're doing here. He, what I, what I presented to the, to you guys was based on the knowledge before they dismantled the project, before they dismantled the building. Once they dismantled it, they found they could use a lot more siding. So he suggested let's reuse this siding. What am I supposed to do? No, put it in a dumpster. We got shingles approved. So he reused the siding. And you know, everything else, all the conditions, we didn't violate any conditions on our permit. It was all natural, we didn't paint it a color. I mean, it's a fantastic building that shows character, it shows, it shows what this whole thing is about. And so I think you guys would, would celebrate going and looking at that, you know, rather than just being here every Monday night. That's all we Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tito. On the matter of the Jerome House Carriage House, back to the well, actually, um, anything else from the public on the item of the Jerome House Carriage House? Name, please, for the record. Yeah. Hi, Deborah Lennox. I, I was on a, a walkthrough today and I'm just, just reading this policy, and so I'm 
curious as to what uh, Kelly was suggesting that it would be very helpful if during the process of construction when we come across variations to our previously approved permit, if we could get some guidance like, okay, this is minor enough, you're not going to have to come in front of the board again, or this looks like, because we, John, we went through this with Kavanaugh, we were here three times because we moved a, a, a door, we, we added a, a mechanical shed that we didn't know we needed. So we had to pay the fee again, pay me again, to come here again, present the whole thing again, take your time. So to simplify that, I was told we couldn't do because of the way the town plan is written about not being able to amend an MHRD permit. So if this is the solution to, instead of amending, getting this um, consent calendar process, I thought it was very smooth today to go say, here's an item on the consent calendar. They're still covered under their fee they paid before. You know, they're not signed off yet. So no more money. Then you're going to go look and you're going to say, oh my gosh, you know, they, they designed a, uh, a light shining out in your face. No, you can't do it. You've got to come to us. Or, oh, wow, we love Wind Spirits Light Fisher, which was how I felt. I love Wind Spirits Light Fisher. <laughs> so I was like, <laughs> it just felt very smooth today. So I don't know if we're going to be giving too much power with the way this is written to the staff at the counter, which I don't think the staff wants that. They want clear guidance. So this may need a little more tweaking, but I think you're going in the right direction. Okay. Again, we're, I'm, I'm, I'm asking for Jerome House, Carriage House specific issues, and then we'll talk about the policy. So is there anyone wishing to talk about the Jerome House, Carriage House, as it has been executed slightly different from the original proposal? From the public, anyone? Hearing none, I'll bring it back to the board. It was a public hearing part, so discussion here. So so about about the, the, the yes. drone house. Yeah, there. so I, I'm very clear that um, we're applying elements that we will consider separately. Uh, I feel the same way. I just got I just got this part today, so I don't. Even though I, I think what worked today worked. I'm also not really, yeah. So on the Unita garage, um, I'm absolutely in support. You know, they got in there, they saw what uh, materials they had to work with. I think it is a really nice addition to the neighborhood. And if I can clarify that they will not have to do another fee for, this, for these changes and that they'll be able to move forward, um, I'll be happy to make a motion after uh, I hear from my fellow board members. Make the motion. Yeah. I make the motion. Oh, 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 oh. What she said. I'm, I'm perfectly happy with the changes that have been made to the carriage house. I think it's a beautiful uh, building, the way it's been reconstructed. And so, so I'm happy with it and I'm happy to support any motion you make. And, and I'll, I'll throw in my hat to the whole thing. Um, it's in harmony with what else is there. It's a good piece of materials. It's in harmony with the design considerations for the village. I think it was a good decision, and I totally get that what you originally planned to do and what actually gets executed isn't always the same. This is a great reuse of resources. So, thank you. so your motion? I move that we. What form do we need to make <coughs> uh, I would suggest um, making a motion to accept the changes to MHRB 2020-0007. Um, I have
after it's been approved and before it's final, to make a call about whether they're conforming or not conforming? I believe if you wanted to handle it that way, you have to write it into the conditions of each of the projects that come forward. Writing in flexibility for like a conferring with the review board in that way. Because the way the code is written right now, once a permit is issued, your compliance with that permit is really mandatory. And there can be conditions that can allow for sort of that flexibility and revisiting. And I think that's what the planner's white service is saying too, is that that could be handled through you know, crafting conditions as opposed to a policy. So maybe if we were to throw in a condition that says to the effect any any deviation to the approved permit can be heard by MHRB before the final is within the proposed application or something. Yeah, we have to do some work sniffing around. Something to that effect. Yeah. And then it would have to obviously come onto an agenda for that action to occur. Yeah. Thoughts? I'm going to want to see the language before I oh, watch okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I it. Okay. Probably, it's probably do something about fees. But conceptually, yeah. it's not. Yeah. 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 If I may, if it's in a condition, there's no additional fees no, 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 collected no. unless it's specified within the actual condition itself. I'm sorry, it may be worth clarifying just because people think it's a coming back and or they need to pay something. It seems really clear catching it at final and then, and then having the um, minor alterations brought to the board for the consent calendar, the way you guys have outlined that, that seems really clear. Allowing a midstream um, review, as helpful as that would be from a builder's standpoint, I can see it becoming pretty complicated in terms of what becomes minor at that point. Like, I want to add a window. I want to remove a window. Like, then we might find ourselves hearing a lot of alterations. I mean, it would be, I think it would be definitely useful to try that on some permits and see how it goes. And maybe the language of number five could be made more simple to where it does allow that. Um, but it seems really clear to do it at the end, although that puts the builder at some risk because the builder then has to decide sort of on their own, am I deviating from the norm? But it's also not that complicated to know if you're deviating when you look around this town and you see what kind of things look like. Um, so I think it's a good idea to be able to streamline this thing for sure. I, I, I think what would be good idea, what, having worked with staff for almost the last five years, <coughs> They don't want to make decisions, they want us to make the decisions. So they want to make it as objective as possible. So I think that anything that they couldn't sign off on as being appropriate and true to the permit of the application will be something that come upon us. And I like the idea in response to Mr. Grimes. I don't think we're handing over the, the chicken coop or the hen house to the staff, but what I think it is, if it comes on consent, we all have the opportunity, we can, we can just approve the consent calendar and be done with it. Or if we find that there's so much deviations in an application where we pull from consent and have a discussion like this, we can do that. So I don't think we're handing over any authority. You know, the process like this one we just did works good, except I do think that, like Mr. Grimes said, that paragraph two there doesn't make a whole lot of sense because it's still Correct. requiring to happen prior to the issuance of the building permit. Yeah, and this is all after after the building permit. So, and were we reading that correctly, Sam? The line out of two there? Yes. So um, to address a few things that have been brought up, um, with you know, request for guidance here, of course. Um, appreciate this conversation. Um, any you know recommended language here is much appreciated. I would like to point out at the bottom of the policy, the note, um, you know, it mentions on you know the MHRB. Review board will have you know, the final uh, determination in the event that say any ambiguities uh, occur uh, that cannot be right, readily uh, determined to say a related uh, structure or permit. So um, I think that kind of captures a little bit of uh, what was previously said. As for your question, uh, or on regarding the policy on that language on number two, um, that was trying to capture in the process of you know trying to figure out where we're going to capture this 
minor alterations procedure and policy. So whether that be either before the building permit or towards the end with the final as condition language five currently reads, um, you know, it's upon issuance of the building permit and it's the finalization. So it's you know the step of the foundation, all of the uh, building um, building reviews of say the structure and how it's uh, completed and that's the final uh, sign that we're able to say okay this was in conformance with the approved permit. So whether we change what you know this proposed policy would have after that, that that's definitely up for today. So why don't I make this suggestion? Um, why don't four of you make your comments to this in front of me? And I'd be happy to work with staff and revise this and bring something forward. Do you have time for the next meeting? Or do you have anything after that? I think that's a groundwork. I think we have to deliberate in public. If, if, you, if you individually <laughs> send your edits, to me, that's not a dog issue. We're not having it. So we're not just deferring? Correct. Can I take one stab at it real quick here? Can you say something really simple like, upon final inspection, all deviations to the uh, project or noticed by planning staff will be brought before the board um, to approve under the existing permit or send back requiring an additional permit? That way, there's no, there's nothing for them to have to think about. If the alteration was a bit large, we're going to see it when it comes to us, and we're going to say, yeah, that should go back for another permit application. Like we went to the one, I forget which one it was. There was a bunch of minor, kind of behind my place, a bunch of minor little stuff. Had that come to us, we I think we would have approved that. We could site visit that. We probably would have approved it. I think some sort of language like that would be really simple. And that would any changes if somebody decided to build their building 16 larger, and that gets caught by staff. Obviously, we're going to say that doesn't work. But all those changes, and that way every project has the same um, guidelines. There's no, is this major, is this minor? Um, and it takes it away from Juliana Cherry or the inspector at the time having to make a change. And then actually, that being said, I. I like what you said earlier with the opportunity to have the applicant come back and notice if, if something happens, they're like, oh shoot, I can't do it this way. This is it's a little more than just minor to be able to come back in front of us without an additional fee under the same permit to review that more significant change. Prior to the change being done? Yes. Prior, prior to them executing the work? Yes. So yeah, that's what I was going to ask for clarification on because oftentimes we get when someone said that between when they get their own interview approval and they submit their building permit, sometimes things have changed. Yeah. Their window sizes have changed based upon what was available or something along those lines. Um, so making sure that that's captured in this as well. Um, so I see sort of two problem. One would be that if, if during the process of construction the applicant or their agent realizes there's some significant deviation, they have the opportunity to come before us for a determination, as well as uh, before the final, that all deviations be brought forth to us with, under the same application on consent code. And um, so my only request I think would be, would one, to be that we can clarify on the policy, because I think what will be important for both staff and the review board is like what material needs to be provided to our office, so you have the information in front of you to actually take action on it. Or is it, you know, someone just comes to the front and I'm, here I got five burnt outs, and then let me show you what I did. Um, so that's where I think at least if staff we can work on sort of what that would look like. So if you guys have enough, does that have enough direction to be able to propose a, a more refined policy that we could then discuss at our next meeting? I have this hearing, but I think the discussion contained here, definitely I can uh, craft something up. And not, not, not this meeting. <laughs> <here. laughs> no, no, no. I mean, I, I would, to be able to thumbs up or thumbs down a policy, I want to be able to, to review it ahead of time. Well, and that way, when it comes to us in the package, we can all have a chance to review it, mark it up, 
and then have discussion and with changes either approve it or whatever. So you want to do it two steps. You want to have time to do the review, changes, and then us comment or should we comment and then give it a good view and not give it a good I think it can back today.
process is well, I, I, if there's anything we can speak on, I'll ask about that now. And if we are comfortable with what's, we've got two cases, the A and B. If we're okay with that, then we'll have a vote up or down. So, on the consent number. So, does anyone feel the need to pull any items from consent? Kelly actually just saved her. 
money. That if you're not going to make this call, I don't think you're allowed on the glass between the grades. So, real quickly, Sam, it says after the fact application. So, does that mean that the work has been done? No, um, I believe that there was uh, the final windows installed mm -hmm. previously. That's the after the fact. I don't okay. believe that the replacement windows are closed yet. Jesse Walton, Center, if I may. Just please. Uh, yes, yeah, so this request is for the after the fact. There was vinyl windows installed. There was a complaint reported to Planning and Building Services, and as a result, this MHRB permit request to resolve the vinyl installation is presented to you. And the request is to install truly divided window frame. And I looked at the pictures in the glass order. I did not look or interpret staff did not interpret the every word of the agenda. Thank you for educating myself on this. All of us. Um, so should should the, so no, the wood windows have not been installed. The vinyl windows are still in at this time. And the applicant is um, is working on their code enforcement case. So, so this is truly one of those Someone makes an alteration to a building in town. It doesn't meet code. Someone reports to code enforcement. Code enforcement brings it to the attention of the applicant, of the client applicant. Then proposes an application to make it right, and it goes to us. So that would be how something that is done improperly comes before us to be then done properly. So in terms of remedy, this is an application which we then could potentially either deny or continue to have it revised procedurally. Well, it actually is correct that, I mean, the application is that if, if, if we tell them that there are things approved as it was written, which is the, the True divided. two divided windows, and and say just so you know, and you're in the packet, and it's the other kind. So make sure that you're. So can we could we procedurally approve that application with the observation that the order is incorrect? You can condition the permit, and I would suggest having a condition eight and severely because I'm not expert on windows. Uh, but it could be something as simple as that the window shall not contain the glass, the PVC. Um, and I don't know if there's anything further that's needed on that. I think you just simply stick. I think you just simply stick with the wording of the application, which says yeah. that they're going to use wooden windows that are true by the light, yeah. and that we're willing to approve. And. Maybe somebody can just tell them, just so you know, your Delvin order isn't that. Okay. Um, is that possible? Because this ties because this ties into our discussion about windows um, that we're going to have later in the meeting. They could also be made aware that you know, if we adopt a policy that allows the clad, because there are also clad windows that are true to by the um, and I think that's the important thing. It's not that the windows are solid wood, it's that they're true to the light. Tell me what's going on. Are we good as the board? No. Because what I'd like to do is like go back to opening to the public and then bring it back for the discussion. Good, good in the sense that it's a good point and we need to correct it. Okay. We need to sum that before we don't understand it. Okay, so procedurally, I'm going to open it. Yeah, these are true wood. These are wooden windows. True to the light wood windows. Okay. okay, so we're going to open this to the public. Please approach the podium, state your name for the record. Jeffrey yeah, Grimes. Uh, I believe that after the fact, permits are being special treatment here. Have you, have you guys made a site visit to this place? They're proposing to replace 22 windows in the town of Mendocino with no site visit. And what they're proposing is they're giving you two, an east elevation and a south elevation. And they're, you know, they're done like 30 years ago hand drafted, and uh, they're proposing to replace 22 windows. I don't know on the floor plan which 22 windows we're talking about, 
that I can guarantee you, guarantee, that on the north elevation facing the street, the two windows on the far east side of the building are aluminum windows. They have aluminum grids, they're aluminum windows, unmistakable. The other windows all on this facade are all nice wood windows with a nice thin mullion down the middle. There's a huge difference, but I think that a site visit is in order for a violation of this size. Thank you. Thank you. Um, name for the record, please. Hi, I'm Lennox. I'm going to call on the expertise of the contractors and architects in this room, but I don't know a manufactured wood window with true divided lights. Is there a manufactured window with true divided lights? Lowen makes one that's flat. Yeah. Uh, solid wood window with true divided lights. Can you buy it from a manufacturer? No, you cannot. They must be custom made. They're custom made. We make a lot of them, and they're also made in uh, Lake. So this uh, board has approved multiple wood windows, Jelvin and Martin, with this G. I don't know the initials, but with the dividers between. GBG. Uh, GBG. I'm not crazy about it. I prefer, there's three different types, but you might want to look into that. I just don't, and I agree that this is too big of a project for the consent calendar, and should look at it closely, but I just would like people to keep in mind that true divided lights are custom windows now. They're not something you can buy from a manufacturer. Unless it's all in, and they allow aluminum, which I haven't heard that yet. <laughs> Deborah, sorry, why are you are still up there? If it wasn't that, Multi light style, there are wooden windows that you can buy. Well, you have to get them custom made, but they have different ways all, of putting all wooden them. windows have to be custom made. That's not that's what I'm wondering. No, only only mold yeah. windows. Yeah, so if you have a single hung or a double hung or a picture window or a casement window, yeah. you can buy those manufactured from Marvin and Pella and a bunch of other brands as wooden windows. When you have mullions, you know, dividing them. Or grills, they have to be custom made, or uh, the only the only commercial what I know is made by Low, a Canadian company that has aluminum cladding in the exterior. And and then sometimes there's a variety of how you do the grid. They can put them with a separator in between them, which is actually a higher quality grid. Sometimes they just have a grid plastered on one side of the glass, which is I don't think acceptable. So I think this one might be the highest quality. Of the body light spy and the new manufacturer. Just saying, not that it's perfect, but it's. Uh, it's the not fundamental perfect. issue is the drawing as done does not reflect the order. So, isn't that what has to go back to the. Yes. Correct. Yes. And that's really the nub of the issue. And so, what, what do they propose to do about that problem? That's what we're trying to get to. So, the question of Wood windows versus non windows is actually on our agenda this evening. Mm -hmm. So we're going to get to that at a later point. But this is not wood windows. But I'm not saying wood windows versus non wood windows. I understand. I'm saying, yes. the, 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 to go back to this particular person, whatever it is, the, the problem they presented us with is what they put on the drawing pictures we looked at does not represent what they ordered. So what is their solution to that problem? That's what we have to do. Well, we can improve the application with it being true divided lights of wood. Yeah. And that's, that's what would be oh, not the GG solution. If I may, the chair. Um, may I suggest continuing the item and then the applicant supply a uh, description of the window that they do intend to use and then it shows that it is true divided windows? I, I like that plus I would also I and I, I did go and I did my own site visit. It was not per the group visit that we had and I walked <coughs> over and I looked at it and I could see clearly you can tell the vinyl versus non-vinyl. I did not with my eagle eye spot the aluminum but I believe it. Um, I, I think that would be a good observation we to have something, a rendering of the four sides, maybe not hand done from 1970, whatever, but a, a depiction with um, which of the windows are compliant with code, which ones are trying to be changed out, 
and a spec sheet on exactly what they're trying to do to meet the existing code. I would assume you'd like to do the site visits. Probably wouldn't hurt. Yeah. Once we actually get elevations identified, stays, goes, stays, goes, stays, goes. So it will not come back then as a consent calendar item. Right? It'll come back as a public right? Correct. Right. So any more discussion? No, that was the okay. uh, So uh, we move to continue this item. Do you need a vote? Uh, we do, and we do need a date. Um, if I ask, kind of lightning, do you think you think we have something for next month? I would recommend May 1st of 2023. And if I'm not able to obtain, a, if the applicant is not able to obtain, I will present um, a continuance to a date certain at that date, if that is okay. So, uh, then the continuance to May 1st for uh, this item with a uh, sample of the windows. Would it be four elevations with identification of what each of those windows is, whether it's compliance or if it's going to be replaced? And if it's going to be replaced, we need a cut sheet that shows that it's not a GEG that's compliant with our code. Do we need a motion to continue? Yes. I'll make a motion to continue. Is there a second? We'll second. Um, can I see the effort? Any opposed? Seeing none. So a motion to continue to May 1st, 2023.
Uh, both the redwood siding and fence will be unpainted and unstained, and that concludes our presentation. If there are any questions. And I believe that the agent for the project is here, should you have any questions? Is the agent here? Would you like to make any additional comments? There would be no fence removed. Okay, could you come to the podium, state your name, and, and comment for us and the public? Mike Casey. Uh, it says it's fence removed, but there's no fence removed. Okay, your name? Mike Casey. Thank you, sir. And the comment lines? It, it says that there was going to be some fence removed. The fence only, only goes so far and stops that right where we're going to take it out. There's a, if you saw that taller piece of edge that was there, that is an ATT phone booth. It's kind of removed by a head. That's the painting. It's not coming out. We're going to go next to the booth and take out two to the side. Is there really a phone booth underneath that? Yeah. I could be, it would be a, you know, a belt. Bike shed, 
utility enclosure and plumbing battery and storage shed all come under the 25% maximum lot coverage. And um, the applicant is requesting a setback exception uh, allowed pursuant to the review process in Chapter 20760. Uh, staff is recommending that the review board consider granting a concurrent variance and adopt recommended finding C for a reduced yard setback from six feet to two feet for the bike shed and pump and battery storage shed and a reduced yard setback from six to zero feet for the utility enclosure, which is the fence uh, around the water source tank here. Uh, the single family residents will have horizontal wooden siding uh, and utility ways, uh, wooden doors, windows, and painted uh, and trim will be painted distinct gray. Uh, all wooden picket fence will be painted Chantilly lace, and accessory structures will be painted to match the single family residence. Uh, downcast exterior lighting as well as path lighting is proposed that is dark sky compliant. Um, an exterior spiral staircase contained in a wooden enclosure to resemble the likeness of a water tower is perso uh, proposed on the western elevation. Um, Materials will include light powder-coated stainless steel with vertical balustrades, uh, wooden, tread, and handrails. Uh, roofing materials include composite shingles with solar arrays on the eastern and western roof elevations. Uh, contingent on approval of this NHRB permit, adequate findings can be made to further process a categorical exclusion permit for the proposed residential energy. And I would like to note that in 2020, there was a previous uh, proposal before the board for single family residents as well on this vacant lot. So, uh, with that, I'm available for further questions. Do you know why the other one didn't happen? I believe there was uh, transferring uh, some property ownership. And the prior applicant. Purchased the property, put together an application, put it on the MHRB, it was approved, and then they sold the property to the current applicant. Correct? Uh, we kept the uh, porch on the second 
level, the um, balcony on the second level is in the same location as the previously approved balcony because that's the, that's the sweet spot. And then she wanted to go up higher with an observation deck, which is designed to refer to a water tower. But the reality is that I am not an architect that likes to mimic history. I like to take the elements of the historical fabric and then create something new that still speaks to the history of the town, but also um, um, speaks to the needs of my client. And also, it's kind of cute. So we're hoping that you all think this is kind of cute, because I think it's kind of cute. And um, Marshall loves it, and, but there are some things about it that we, we could, uh, you know, we like the feedback on. We could do a little bit of um, changing some things around if they're not too significant. <laughs> if there was some feedback that was something we hadn't already considered. So I appreciate that. Anyone have questions? Okay. Well, we'll be thank you. Proceed here. Let's up to the public. We'll bring it back. If there are questions back, we can do that at the time. I put my paper over your recording device. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone from the public wishing to speak? Please come to the button speak your name. Good evening. My name is Todd Neuberger. I'm a local architect, and I'm here representing <coughs> excuse me, Andrea Shepard, who is a neighbor of this project. So this is her property right here, the Jason property. <coughs> Andrea also is very fond of views to the ocean. She has a two-story structure here with a balcony overlooking what will be this structure. <clears throat> okay, um, so she's asked me to come here and speak to you all and convey some of her concerns. Um, okay, so I think the primary and the big ticket concern is this viewing tower. So we live, uh, she, so she, she doesn't think that this viewing tower nor this rotunda style appendage um, fits historically within the character of the Mendocino community. Not the most uh, immediate structures, the Nichols House, Cafe Beaudelais, the various residences that surround this house, but she doesn't find um, this type of character throughout the village either. Um, we do see true water towers around the boat. We, we don't see um, faux water towers or this type of tower um, elsewhere. Um, the, the bulk of this building, um, in also in particular, the way that this roof line, the, the, this steeper shed roof, um, and that it's broad, and there are broad overhangs. Uh, add, add to the mass of the structure and how it is um, an imposing view shed for her and for the community at large when they are walking down the street in front of the building, approaching in this direction or coming up from the boat away. Um, there's a couple of problems that she and, uh, perceives. Number one, there seems to be a fire hazard situation going on here. Um, they have a generator, 30 seconds. which... 30 seconds. So, what? 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Uh, maybe more than 30 seconds for this. Generators require three feet of clearance all around it. This is in, within an enclosure. Propane tank needs to be 10 feet away from a generator. Or these batteries are also a potential fire hazard. Uh, this water tank is not illustrated. The surrounding fencing is not going to be uh, potentially uh, not suitable to screen it. Um, I would she would suggest that the bike. Um, the, the play heights on, on all of these structures could be lowered. They're all being designed in eight foot plates. A bike storage shed certainly could have a six foot plate, uh, as well as these, uh, th these units here, which are not being depicted clearly. Um, 
these are showing us independent structures. We would be, not be able to be constructed in that way. It'd likely be one continuous, so the mass is actually much bigger than just what you're seeing here. This roof line could be, um, the pitch could be lessened, the play height could be dropped on all, uh, play height could be dropped, mitigating um, the visual impact. This fence uh, does not have historical character around the community. Uh, all of this material is being painted white. We are often accustomed to uh, non-stained, non-painted wood fencing in the community. Um, she has no problem with the color scheme, but um, it seems that there could have been design that could have lowered this building. We can see that we, there's, there's quite a heavy base on this building. Um, there's about a three foot grade change from the front of this lot to the back of this lot. This house could have been cut in with a little bit of a retaining wall here, reducing the, the house could have been built on a foundation wall, reducing the height of this whole overall structure by three feet. Um, so when you look at these numbers here, it's 26 and a half plus the average distance of one and a half feet. So they're actually, you know, they're hitting 28 feet of maximum height immediately and uh, to, to exact. And that's a very hard item to hit. And it's often not going to be hit. They're going to be over. So, um, you know, let's see a, pro a proposition that's, you know, six inches under maximum, giving you the flexibility of construction. It doesn't work out that way. Um, and then the character, I'll be quick in summing. Um, the number of divided lights here is seeming excessive for um, what's typically seen around the community. So we're typically seeing two over twos, singles. This is seeming to be um, a bit heavy and not in character with the architectural um, community. So that's. Um, oh, and so the variances are being requested from six to two, and so we are objecting to that as a mitigation measure. I mentioned that these heights of these structures could come down, if, and that way there's a six foot fence there. If we don't need to see these structures right up against her fence, if they lower them to six feet, she could support that variance. Um, okay, that's what I have. Anyone else from the public question comment? Am I allowed to come back up for a couple of Are you just think something I forgot? Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. Just wanted to point out to the board and the public that on the site plan here, what I didn't describe was we're having screening trees along the corner. So this this corner here, which is our, our, our sunroom, this is south, this is the nicest little place to sit. There's going to be trees screening it. Um, you can see a big tree on the corner here, and a big tree, and a smaller tree here, and a smaller tree here. And then as you walk up School Street, there'll be another one that's going to be, I, I should put the trees on here, so there'll be a tree here on School Street, and then also in the back on this corner, next to Andrea's shed, there's going to be another <coughs> tree here. So as you're walking down the street, we, Marcia doesn't want to have the public be perceiving this as um, you know, a big volume in your face. It's going to be mitigated by the screening of the trees and then there's a picket fence. So there's a, blue, there's a distance that you get from, that, from this um, perception. It's a tricky corner. It's a corner design, so you're going to see these two corners. Andrew's the person that's going to be looking at the northeast corner um, from, her, from her view. So, I mean, she's looking at the back of the house. I don't know, I don't know what to tell her. But that, I just wanted to point out those pictures. Thank you. Does the public have any more time? This is about three minute people here. Are you going to keep it short? We're going to put another three minutes. Yes. Um, so while I'm, I'm also a landscape designer, and I'm a huge fan of planting trees, but the planting of a tree now will take 20 years to mitigate any views of this corner, and I don't think that's a reasonable um, 
approach to mitigating the volume um, that that element brings to the, the public uh, experience of, of being on that street. Um, so, thank you. Yes. I have a couple of public hearings right back to the board. Comments, thoughts, questions, concerns? I guess one question I heard potential fire hazard is that in our remit? Does that come up with the building permit? Yes. How would these be a building code standards? And is that likely to be the case? Knowing what the impact is, you know? I can't say I'm talking about it. You definitely cannot have a propane tank next to a generator. There was no generator. And you can definitely not have a generator in an enclosure. It's not as clean now. Can we point? Thank you. But I do want to move it. I just wanted to, you know, I do ask the one thing I want to do with the generator to get the size of that generator. Just saying. Okay. Okay. So, in anything that the building department deems is not following code will be modified, at which point, with our prior. It sounds like we're for a long period of time. And then that would actually be brought back to us for consideration on consent okay. calendar as we yeah. propose to hopefully be in place by the time we get to them finally in the But if we're not supported with the very intention, Well, I, I, I don't know. It's not another one. Well, I'm going to get a chance to make changes in the meeting, right? That's what always happens. Sure. We have a conversation and we make some changes. Yeah. Yeah. Correct? Please correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. Thank you, because I absolutely want to do that, particularly in, this, in relationship to the, uh, the sheds in the back. So I'm happy to talk about that with you. Okay. Yeah. Now, my second call, maybe I, I think. Can I get some more information on, on the height? of these sheds and enclosures that are talking about. I think the site of control getting it on the plans. So A1.0 we have uh they're eight feet tall to the plate line. Yeah. And so at the peak that's eleven foot two feet two and a half on the sheds. My sheds eleven foot two and a half, the pump battery sheds are nine foot nine. So they, yeah. So you're concerned. So there are just two of them that are that high. The others are well, some of the fences. Fences are less than six feet, I think. Uh, water tank enclosure looks like the fence is six foot, and the propane generator enclosure is six foot. Yeah. We have the picket fence is three six, and the wooden fence is six foot. There's, there's no retaining wall drawn in the back there, so I guess my question is what height is that taken from? Deborah, is that going to be from the very back fence and the front of those foundations are going to come up? Or is it going to cut down below the fence at the back um, and then retain the fence on those sheds? We have about six feet of depth on that. structures and 
and then have it be uh, flattened out. So we could probably bring it down. So this blade here would be a, a, a cut blade. We could probably bring it down a foot, I would say. What we did for it. And so the slope of the property, I've had this conversation before, is about, it's actually, you can see the uh, contour lines on the plot plan. It goes from 105 down to 100. So it's actually a five foot drop from back to front on the whole property. So we were just trying to keep the, um, the foundation to be not uh, dug into the earth because when you do that, you have to do a remediation for getting the moisture out from under the crawl space. So where I've done that at the Cavanaugh's, we have to put a mechanical ventilating system in the crawl space. So we're trying to just keep the natural ventilation, which is why the back elevation of the house was going to go ahead and be at that 103 contour line, and that's and then it drops down to the 101. So there's like two foot four. So 103 and a half to 101 is a good um, two and a half feet. And then on my understanding of height was you take the mean the, the mean distance from one end to the other of the house, and you find that average and you go up. So at this point. The average height of the, um, the cut of the building itself could also be lowered somewhat without uh, too much of an impact on the ventilation. So that's the uh, that's where I would offer that we could do a little bit of um, finagling on the heights of these uh, structures in order to get the get the, the overall height a little lower if that's something that would be appealing to the neighbor. This is the first we've heard anything from the neighbor uh, adjacent. So tonight we're talking. So at this point, um, we're willing to have some conversations about how we could um, work on the heights of the shed. The bike shed is plus six feet is not an unacceptable plate height for a bike shed. I don't know who has a bike shed at six feet, just put your head on it. At the plate, the, to the gable. You yeah. Have gable. You have plenty of room in there. Yeah. Inside for sure. So uh, at this point, also the other uh, what I'd like to offer besides moving the um, moving the generator to the other side of the bike shed and then giving a propane room in that enclosure. And that enclosure does not have a roof on it. It's just a little fence. You can see it uh, in, uh, on the V1. The propane enclosure design is kind of a, a whimsical fence that's in that area. We could also do that on the other side of the bike shed. For the, for the generator, so we would get the separation, there would be no fire danger. The, the battery storage will have to have a one hour firewall around it, and no matter what, because that's the nature of batteries. But I, I'm all about the propane. Did I, did I, did I hear that as per Title 22, the battery storage facility is required? Either a battery storage facility or the ability to hook up to it. In the and this is as of January of this year, as for Title 24. So we had to find out where to put where to put about a potential battery storage, and so keeping the mechanicals on the far side of the property seemed to be the best idea. And then, as far as uh, the request for the variance of the distance to the back fence, I don't see what difference it makes to the neighbor if this is to you know how close this is to. Her neighbor's back fence. We're not criticizing her shed on the property line. They got a, they got the waiver, so now she doesn't want to give it to Marsha. It doesn't make sense to me. So uh, I, I hope that if we could come to some kind of an agreement on lowering the height of these sheds by having a retaining wall in the back and lowering the grade, but keeping the height of the sheds themselves. Again, the sheds are pretty minimal, so we're open to any kind of um, changes that might make it more palatable to the community and perhaps maybe one or two of them would be wood instead of white but Marsha likes white so right now everything is white although white isn't really white because it's shadows and it's a it's a, a, it's a subtle thing so uh, any other questions about those sheds along the back wall and I don't know, am I allowed to change that in the meetings to say to relocate the, uh, the generator to the east side of the bike shed? Since it's not covered, is it not lot coverage? <laughs> <laughs> Some question. 
Uh, I mean, I think certainly things could be conditioned to like relocate items, but it would have to stay underneath any law coverage. Yeah, I don't want this yeah. to come back around. I'm not going to, you know, die on the hill of putting the propane tank next to the generator when I, you know, it was just something I overlooked. So I definitely want to move. I want to have separation for the propane and the generator, and I think putting the like shit in between is a is a good solution. You know, it should be fine if it's not increasing the sizes. Overall. It's not increasing the sizes, it's just moving it to the yeah. east side of the bike shed. So changing the functions of the structures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it would be the same uh, look as that, uh, the, the gates, because again, it's not covered. And then I actually let one, the one thing that Todd said I really liked was the idea of combining the battery storage and the pump, so that pump battery shed, instead of having the, you know, having the two sheds, it's going to be impossible to build that. It's, it's true, it should be one shed with um, the pumps and the battery, and if the battery has to have, a, if it has to have a partition in it with five eighths inch um, dense shield on it, then so be it. But I think having three as one shed instead of two is probably a better architectural direction to go. So I'm fine with that. Thank you, Todd. Mm -hmm. Chair Roth, if I may. Yeah, um, I just want to provide some uh, clarifications here and address the question that was asked in the, uh, the site visit. So um, as for height, we're looking at a 28 height limit for uh, the zoning district of the subject parcel. Um, and, you know, that's measured from any point on the ground. So, um, you know, compliant with that, um, this would still meet the, you know, 28 height limit, but it would be coming in pretty close. So as for, uh, it was previously mentioned on the roof form, uh, the design guidelines provide that overhangs are recommended uh, for roof shapes. As for um, the distance of the structures and where you guys previously approved with the NHRB permit for Andrea Shepherd on the subject lot to the, the west, um, that distance right there, if I may go up there, we're looking at, um, just for the proximity of the concurrent variance for the setbacks here. So we're looking at a 70 foot uh, lot line. The structure shed here proposed is 20, or what was approved, should I say, was 20 feet. And we're looking at a clearance of around 28 feet for this gap right here. So give or take eight, eight feet from the nearest structure like shed to the shed that will be on the adjacent lot to the west. So are you saying that from uh, Elevation line 101, which is our lowest, more or less our lowest point on property. It's only 28 feet from that point to the peak of the roof. No he said he said I'd be from any point on the property 28 feet, or from the mean or from the average grade, which would be taken from Concord line maybe 103. The main grade as uh, listed on the plans here are 102.25. Uh, uh, so 101, uh, you know, that would be, you know, the math. Well, from, is, it, is it from the maximum to the lowest point, or is it from the mean? mean? Is it the, the, the building height is measured from any point on the ground. So any point, to my way of reading this contour line, the lowest point that this building and book covers is right around, just below the 101 contour. 100.75 looks like. It's, on, right. the, it's on the elevations, right yes. at lowest, 101. 101. 101. Yeah. So you're saying that from 101 to the peak of this roof is not more than 28 feet? I am because it's 26 feet 6 from the mean grade, and the mean grade is 102.25. Okay. So it's 120. No, how, how is it from the mean grade? Because how is the mean grade taken? Like what point, what point on the property is the mean grade? Mean grade is from the lowest to the highest and is subtract and divide by two. 101 to 103.5, halfway is 102.25. Oh, you're right, 26.6 here. Right. You're going to that. Right. I, I gave you, I, I We're nine inches higher, so we can lower it nine inches. So lowering it at a foot, as what I said earlier, with that would make everything Compliant, and we're happy to lower this a foot. How, how are you doing that? By cut? 
with a cut. Yeah. Uh, so we and that and that cut would be would follow the one of the three contour line more or less? So the one oh five point five finish floor would be one oh four point five. That would be that apron around the bottom. So the apron would be a foot less in the front. And you can still deal with your ventilation issue? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think we've still got enough room there to get some um, vents between the, uh, the joists. Are you, are you lowering the finished floor height? Yes. By a foot? By a foot. Okay. Because you're then starting to look Two feet of elevation drop at that back corner. 
rather than one. We'll, we'll look at it. Yeah. I think we're going to ask for a continuance on this. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. We're fucking waiting. Yeah. You're great. I'm great. Um, so, I guess two comments. I, don't know. I assume there'll be some further discussion between the, the two parties as we go and you said you had a discussion and it seems like you need to do that um, before you come back. So, if you come back with something that isn't a disagreement with it, you can. Um, the other thing was, uh, to me, I don't know if you guys feel the, the, that little deck with spiral staircase was a little weird. I'm not sure how that fits into the time, so historic. I, I agree on that. I, I'm not a fan of the, uh, the staircase or the, the, the spewing platform. Um, to me, it's inconsistent with almost any other uh, building in Mendocino. I, I've never seen anything like this, quite like this. I mean, there's already a, a, a balcony that provides views, so I'm not sure why this kind of a viewing platform is necessary. I think it's, it detracts from the overall look and design of uh, this uh, building. So uh, I have problems with it. Okay. May I ask that, that everyone is looking at Dan's Extent we can uh, 
minimize that impact uh, of the sea. We don't have any color call out for the roof material. <coughs> I called out whether it would, but I I hear your this is very difficult on the site to figure out where to screen or how to make the solar panels less visible. So I'm not usually a black roof person, but I think we could go with the black charcoal colored roof to go with the solar panels in order to have it not be a visual Difference yeah. of the color. I think a good example, a good example of what works. Um, I'm thinking of the corner of the Ukiah and uh, you know, Howard. Yeah, where the, the, the small houses behind the, the, the two houses. houses. Yeah, and, and they did a good job of collecting the two. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And that's where you get that. I, I don't, I don't like. Clearly, a dark roof is going to have more heat. But on the coast, that's not the worst thing. Yeah. And where you get the blending of the roof material and the solar panels, I like that. Yeah, we can change that. I, I think that that viewing deck is it's whimsical. Yeah. You, you, you nailed it. It's cute. It's whimsical. But I I think I have all my I don't I don't know that I can cite anything in town that looks like that unless you can give us a well I, I did have a back pocket suggestion on this one which yeah. was that we don't do the spiral stair in it and we did a wooden stair that's kind of like the one in the water tower we looked at last month but it's um, you know it, it's not a water tower we're still on the second floor but we did I think the thing that seems distracting in the plants is the curves. And if that's what bothers you, I think we could get rid of the curves and have it be more angular, like a little winder stair with the squared off railings, if that's helpful. But um, the Marsha wants the view, so she wants to get up there. And everything I've done has always had for her, through all the variations of this project, has had a viewing platform. And I mean, it could end up being a water tower if we have to at some point. But she wants to get up there. And I don't know if it's anybody's business that you know, she wants to work on. <laughs> I mean, it's valid. I, I mean, I could want it to be too. I, I totally get it. But at the same time, your view might be impacting your neighbor's view. That's also not the purview of this is true. This board view. But, well, but I think uh, that I want to do. I want to make something that's architecturally compatible with the historical district, and so this is me. And I would like to think I can use the elements of the architectural history in a new way because it's a new building. It's not a historical building. So that's. The, and I meant to bring my design guidelines, as it says in the very first paragraph, about um, respecting and enhancing. The, uh, historical fabric, but not Yeah, we, we don't want to recreate a building that already exists, but we do want those design elements to keep it within the fabric. Um, so, so I'm, I'm kind of stuck as a designer with the fact that she wants that platform pretty much no matter what. So I'm going to have to figure out how to make that palatable. More integrated with the other elements so we don't go, ooh, that's kind of unique. The way, the way to get a tall viewing platform that's so to do like a traditional widow's block, which would basically build, build into the roof plane so it doesn't, it's not an auxiliary structure of posts coming up out of the building. It's built into that upper gable roof. And well, are there any widow's blocks in this? I don't think there are, but I think that so that's, I'm not sure that's let, let me, can I just finish? I think that's the traditional way in ocean towns, oceanside towns, if you wanted to have a view of the ocean way up high, you would do that or build an actual water tower with slope sides that looks like a water tower and is a water tower. And then you can go up a water tower. But to have a structure that is added to the outside of the building, imagine the staircase that I just put on the back of my building. If I extended that up another story above my roof, I mean, it would be great. I'd love to stand up there and look around. But it would look very odd. You could even charge people to go up there. 
I think that's what we have here. It, it, there's no solution for this because the posts are coming up out of the roof structure. That just doesn't look traditional in any sense. And while there are no widow's walks in the town, I think that something tucked into the roof plane would potentially resolve that problem. Well, there are also historical water towers coming up out of the bottom with a shed on the bottom. So the bottom is a building and they come up out of that. But, but, I mean, that's usually, I would, not, I would not venture that any historical water tower was built that way. I would say that water towers existed and yet these built buildings underneath them and posts coming out. I'll, How I'll, I'll send you the historical pictures. <laughs> okay, okay. So um, <laughs> just there's one other thing I want to point out, and that's that uh, I think I, I'm a little bothered by the bulking mass of that corner skirt and that maybe some landscaping in front of it okay. could okay. stop okay. that. Are you talking about where the turret, the eight-sided or the six-sided thing is? Yeah. And I'm planning it shows the three trees in front, but there's nothing around it. <coughs> it's just some softening, or maybe, and I don't think I want to say lattice, to something that's not so... No, yeah, there's, there's bushes. I'll, I will come back with a landscaping plan. Yeah. I think, I think it would be helpful if, obviously, we're going to think we're going to we're trying to give you suggestions for a continuance, and so the landscaping plan for that, and if, if you do propose something, this is a recommendation for a viewing platform, that you give us references from within town to say, if, if you, as you redesign this, we think it, if you're taking from something, we'll actually take a picture of whatever it is you're referencing so that you can give us that. So what you're saying is there's no new interpretation of a wooden structure. It has to be no. a replica or no. of a previous. No, I'm just saying. I'm saying if you whatever you end up doing, if there's a reference to something within the town that you help us visualize that by providing a picture of that reference, if, if that's the case, or if you if your client says I just need to have this, then I will work on it. How does the board feel about the? I would, for lack of a better word, I would call it a Turk. Um, or some, I think she's just a son. Yeah, that corner. Yeah, that corner. And, and, and basically the roof line back. Like that doesn't seem, that doesn't seem very traditional to me, historically. At the same, yeah. I, it's the ball question on more of a roof to me. So the shape of it seems okay. You guys yeah. that rounded for me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I yeah. I don't really want to go into it. It's it's um whimsical but not in your face. Mm -hmm. The reference I have for that you're sitting in it actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, right. Okay. Just so you know. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Is that again? What 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 does what, 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 what the roof line do up here? I think it's a bay, I think, so it's not a So it's a hip resolving into a, a it's subservient to yeah, a larger we roof. Yeah, we kept going. So, what, so my, my issue is not the shape of the bay window, it's that you have a turret that is short, dying, and it's not even a complete turret because you have a, you have a shed roof dying into the back of the turret. It's so, not a turret, a turret is tall. Well, it's, 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 it's a sunroom with a, with a conical roof on. Oh, oh, it's a it's a conical roof line with a shed coming into it, and to me that looks more like something that would have been built in the '70s than something like this, where this is built as a bay window, and the roof line is resolved. So if we go outside and we look at the mass, this bay window is going to enhance the elevation, not stand out in front of it. That's that's my concern about that. One. It's not shared by the rest of the board, so that's okay. I mean, I don't, I don't think that would uh, affect my concerns sort of about the, you know, the goal. Yeah, I think really it's that bottom, you know, that bottom apron, just because we think it's going to be, I think it may you know. So that's the height, that's the height issue that she can more yeah, or less Yeah, it would be, be, be reduced degree. a little bit. Yeah, it would be reduced a little bit. Um, 
so not good. Yeah, and we're just being out there. It looks like the Nicholson house is close to 28. You know, like as far as their right. Mm -hmm. um, but they're a, a, a tall, narrow building, sort of. Um, whereas this, because of that base, it's just it's very. So I'm, I think we give them quite a bit of input to the client or applicant and put the question if I may please to the court, yes. So on the recent video, can we ask for the definition of the height of the water tank? Because we've all been required to screen water tanks in the past and the height of the water tank. The height of the water, proposed water tank. Will it be six feet tall and hidden from view, or will it be sticking up out of the proposed fencing? Because I personally install redwood surrounding water tanks as requirements of MHRB, and we all go to great lengths to hide water tanks. We can build eight-foot fences, around, particularly around water tanks. It's going to come up if we don't. If it's not defined in the proposal. I see water tank enclosure at six feet. Right, so we don't have a height of the water tank itself. I gotcha. see that water tank being eight foot in diameter and sticking up at least eight feet gotcha. and being in here. Yeah. One last question, sorry. So I just would want that to find. Okay. I do have one last question to the applicant. Um, what's the idea between like the multiple different um, beds? You know, there's Oh, four or five different, like, is that to, like, uh, break up the look of the sheds, the... Oh, I'm sorry, you mean why are all the sheds, why are there all these little sheds? Uh, why is every design different? You know, like the, you know, the propane is an arched enclosure, the other one is, has lattice on the top, the other one. So the... Because those are all the back, those rear sheds, correct? Yeah, well, the wooden fence uh, is between, is on the west property line, and that was, um, the, the neighbor on the west who we did talk to wanted to have it uh, solidly screened as much as possible. And then um, I think they were, and she got dogs. So this four foot height was uh, solid, it was to keep it so the dogs wouldn't be barking at the neighbor. And then we went ahead and went high with the six foot for the fence. And she wanted this whimsical top on it. So that's just running on the west side only, then the picket fence is on the south and the east. Then um, the reason that the generator, propane and generator enclosure have little arches on it, and it, it is to kind of sort of make a difference between the buildings. They're all painted white, it's just to kind of give a textural difference between them, but we're not, gonna, we're not married to that either. It could all just be straight. I was just I was just curious. I was yeah, just curious. Yeah, so those kind of differentiate the house, between right? the um the, the, the fences are different uses, whereas the sheds themselves were kind of the same design and then it was to just to give a little a little interest to that fence, which is not a shed, it's just a fence. So. Okay. I have one more question. Are you got Marvin windows called out? Are those gonna be in between glass or oh my God. I mean, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Are you guys going to require true divided lights for the rest of every approval? Because no, Marvin does not have true divided lights. No, no, Deborah, I think the trouble with those windows is that the mullions are between the glass. Yeah. Our windows up aren't. Like, they're not true. Yes, they're double oh, pane nice. windows. But they're they not the cheap that. ones that have this fake mullion between glass. They're sandwiched. Yeah, they have like a, yeah, which yeah, is so very gonna, cheap looking. It's the same windows we use in the we don't have We don't have those cheap mullions between glass. We have actual. Yeah, who is the we and what are we talking about? Cavanaugh. Yeah, Cavanaugh. So what, yeah. what manufacturer did you use at Cavanaugh? Marvin. Marvin. But they look like this. So there, is a, so there is a wood window that manufactured it's, it, it's not a true divided. It's not true divided lights. They're not. True, they're not individual panes. Uh, they're double panes. So there's a little strip. That's what she's talking about. The little strip. But they look like this. They're double paned windows mm -hmm. with mullions that come out. They're not what you're talking about and what they're proposing. The mullions sandwiched between glass, which looks cheap. 
I'll have to see that. I understand. Yeah. yeah. This is what they're discussing. Okay, so you can do that with them. Yeah. Yeah. This is the In the interest of time, we still have a bunch more discussions. Do you have a direction? Good. I, I, I'd like to request a continuance to address the um, Yeah, okay. ideas that were brought up. Yeah. 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 Thank you. 
they uh, are conflicting. If it's, if it's in the right. same location, no, so I, that needs to be solved. Yes, yes. Yeah, I agree. Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, also, all locations are predetermined. Like you're talking about a situation where a sign was a single sign for a business. If that business were to move to somebody, some location that's more likely to quarry or we have a whole bunch of signs, they can't bring their sign because it doesn't conform to that business's pre existing signage. They would have to come from that location. Or the allowable square footage. Or the allowable square footage. It wouldn't conform. I'm just saying that as long as it conforms, if I move into a new building and there was Sally Max sign hanging right there, on the square, and I'm going opening home. Why can't I just bring my own sign and hang it there? Why? Why does county and staff? Why do we want to even see that? If it does, if, if, and if, we, if you move into an imperial building, you only have space for your sign to be this building. So why not just bring that sign? So you say it should be replaced like for like. Yeah, like for like with with standard materials that are allowed. And you like code enforcement to take care of any infringement. Yeah, any deviation. Or you know yourself, hey, you know what? I want a big sign on my building because I think it's going to look great. I'm going to go and get a curb if you want. But in the meantime, why do we why do we want businesses having to pay and why do we want care? So if that's the case, what would need to change on the staff side? Couldn't we just say, you know, couldn't we just say that from here on, the long house signage conforms to the requirements of signage, existing and fits in an existing location where signs have been. It's no, no permit is required to erect a sign in Minnesota. So it's nice to go in the way. You want to step up and take us to tour about the covers for us on our side. So I would be slightly more clarification. So I get it, we're talking about the copy of the sign, but if I go back and kind of think about like when we were, were feeling after that signage on the Siegel building, and there was concerns about the sign that had been like mounted in front of the building for Baby Le Pen at that time, right? And there was also concerns about like where brackets were being hung for a new sign over whether you could go over the doorways or not. Um, so I guess I need some guidance on what situation. your expectation would be. In that situation, it's not an existing, like, <clears throat> an that's, that's a new situation. So, like, yeah, the brackets are already in place or something. Yeah. Someone could like, actually, not the brackets, but, like, the actual, if there's an actual two-by-two two on a building and a new tenant moves in and keeps the same colors, meets all the other sign criteria, but it's, it now says that it's Fred's shop instead of the sock shop. Um, if it's an existing, replacing existing sites, like that. But what is the square footage in your house? Like six or something like that? Six. Um, and so, if I'm thinking correctly about when we dealt with the Siegel building, there was like a bracket mount that had been like barge north, I think it was. And the person at the time wanted to pull that bracket and move it down and put it in front of the door. So if I'm understanding correctly, that would trigger yes. a review yes. by the MHA. Sign or that was pretty okay. Yeah, perfect. So, I'm actually, well, like also the baby event situation, the big issue there was they had two signs for one business, correct? If I remember correctly, and yeah. that's again, they erected another sign that was not part of existing signage. I don't think they ever resolved it. They still don't have compliance, isn't it? Yeah, we resolved it. It was a very long meeting in 2019. We approved the one that was on the on the street. Correct. And then they removed the second one that they built the shop. So are we basically saying that if it's a copy change or it's a color change, they don't, they don't have to come to us for approval. But if it's where it's placed or the size of the sign that's different, then you still have to come. Yeah, if it's relocating, so if you're not putting a sign where there's an existing sign, <coughs> if you're moving a sign to a different location, or if the sign is of a different size or shape yeah. than an existing that will come before us. Would be the existing or as long, I think as long as it's under six square feet, but the shape, if you wanted to change your sign from being a rectangle to an hexagon, as long as it's under than six square feet, you're conforming to the code. I think that, that would be fine latitude for the business. I'm fine with giving business owners that much latitude. 
and I don't think it's your issue of like fluorescent orange sign. I can't imagine a business owner wanting a fluorescent orange sign. Yeah. Yes. For what kind Wasn't of business? Wasn't there a tropical bird one? Wasn't there a tropical bird one? I think I think it it's not enough. <coughs> it's, just, it's not enough of a concern. The color issue is not enough of a concern to maybe not support the direction. Um, but I am acknowledging it. Yeah. I, I, why, why would you want to change the color? And take my yeah. head. I don't and think you want to do that. Yeah, I, and I think we probably don't want to touch that part of the table. Yeah. Well, what are the color requirements for saying that this is there? There are there's already existing colors yeah. you want to use. Yeah. Yeah. Color. There's no yeah. color there's no. No. But there, there's a guidance. And you just said there's no numbers allowed. I know. Oh, I mean, there's a few yeah, things like that. Yeah. Like no no, 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 20.712, and that um, ordinance talks about sizes, it talks about font, it talks about square footage is six, one size 12 total, maximums, different things like that. And then in the historical review board guidelines, it, in chapter 20.760, under the MHRB exemptions, there is the discussion about color, size, and location to take a new sign to put it in the old signs location. It's not about parcel to parcel. And I think that the point of the question is, can I take a sign from point A to point B, where the sign copy is very specific in 760 about being exempt from the NHRB review. And I think we're getting a little bit confused between seven 20.760 sign exemptions from MHRB approval and change of location, colors, size, font, similarities to a previous sign in chapter 712 of the code. And this is a planning requirement that is referenced in the Mendocino Historical Guidelines that will end up either in front of you or for staff to make that determination. It isn't about taking a sign from Lansing Street and putting it on Main Street. It is about the sign that is going to replace the old sign's location. So there's very different guidelines, and I'm seeing a head nod. And I just wanted to clarify that there's two very different code sections that reference the sign standards versus the exemptions to be in front of the board. Right. I think we can simplify that by just saying all signs that meet the design standard criteria are exempt from board review unless they want to deviate from that norm or be placed in a location where there have not been previously placed signs. And that way, the townspeople of Mendocino can make a sign and hang it up and not have to go and bypass the entire review process unless they want to deviate from that standard. Kind of like what we're trying to do with the paint colors because it's onerous to business owners to yeah. pay for this stuff. Our, our authority on signs is limited to commercial signs only. So we're not talking about other kinds of signs. We're just talking about commercial signs advertising business there. Yeah. Two, two provisions there, um, outdoor advertising signs means any sign or structure erected, altered, relocated, maintained for any commercial purpose, whether or not attached to a building and so on. And uh, so our authority is limited just to talking about those kinds of signs or considering that. And I, I don't think we need to go beyond that. I don't think we're okay. so, so my question is, is what is you just described, is that within our authority to mandate? If I may, through the chair, mm -hmm. Kyle Waldman, 
Um, we have the medicine on county zoning regulations where we would be needed to make um, some draft amendment to Division 3's Chapter 7, 20.760 with some verbiage back and forth for the director to um, review. Um, to be able to make that decision today on how we would be superseding what Division 3 regulates for the board, we would need to bring you bring back terminology that is approved not only at your level, at the board's level, but also at the director's level, whether that would then need to go to the board of supervisors. So we would have to talk about, she's going to comment. <laughs> Uh, so I'm just going to say is that I think um, Juliana Cherry had brought forward a discussion to you guys in June of 2021 on sign copy changes. I don't recall being present at that meeting. I'm, I'm not sure if all of you were present at that meeting. Um, but it looked like at that time there was some direction given and a desire to see that a policy be prepared um, regarding sign exemptions. So I think really what the next step is from here is probably to have staff do similar to like what we did with um, the item on, on minor alterations to prepare a draft policy for consideration for adoption by both you know, the director, signed by the director, and the review board as well. Um, and we'll take the comments from tonight and try to work that in with some of the existing guidance that we already have that's provided through the code in terms of sign copy changes um, and see if we can come up to something that's agreeable. And then I was going to say, I was part of that discussion, and at the time the board was considering if the sign remained the same size, used the same colors that were originally approved, then and same font, then the copy could change. Can I just say that? Oh, go ahead. I was just going to reiterate that I, I don't think there's a desire to, you know, change the sign regulations, you know, just that we're trying to figure out how to streamline the process. And, yeah. Well, there is one thing that needs to change, and that's if, if the permit belong to a business and the business changes, you you don't need a new permit for a new sign that reaches the requirements. That's, that's something that's, that could be changed. That, that needs yeah. to be changed. Yeah, that could be changed. Yeah, and I, have, and I have to say that one of the things I brought up was like the font. It's like, I, I don't think that, the, you know, if you did have a different font, that it would drastically but, change the yeah. historical character of the day. No, I, 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 I'm, saying, <laughs> so, I'm, I'm just saying, like, you know, Rick, Rick pointed that last meeting, a, yeah. a very definitive sort of Yes. That we need to solve. Um, I would like to say that that would be solved if we went a little further, even, and just said adhere to the criteria of the signage because everything else requires us to review what was previously approved, and then now you have to follow the steps of what was previously approved, which is a tracking problem for both you guys and the businesses. Whereas if we just say, if you adhere to these standards, you are exempt, just like we're saying with paint color. If you use these paints, you can just do your thing. That lifts a lot of work from staff and from us. So I would agree that would be as simple as possible. So, I, I, if I may, just mm -hmm. um, two comments on that. I think so, that will open up, like, I mean, mainly what I've seen come before the review board is like there may be concerns about too many colors being on a sign. So, it sounds like we might be going down a pathway that's similar to what we have for the exterior paint mm -hmm. policy, where you might be looking at limiting how many colors are considered exempt. <laughs> And not requiring review board approval, so just the rabbit hole starts to go deep, <laughs> starts to go deep very quickly. Um, and then my only other comment is just more so from a staff perspective. Like when sign copy changes come in, um, when I first started here, we would spend uh, if someone came into the front counter, you'd go dig through every single NHRB permit that ever been issued on the property to see if you could possibly find colors that would match the sign that someone was standing up front with. <laughs> Um, and so that practice is unsustainable from a staff perspective. So the other thing is like, you know, if there's even a limit, like if you stick with what was colors that were previously approved at the site, um, or a sign that's been previously reviewed and approved by NHRB, maybe at an alternate location that's being relocated, um, that would eliminate a lot of the staff having to go back in time, or even we can put a limit on how far back in time staff is going. Because when we dig through, I mean, there's permits going for very far back. So it's <laughs> critical, but we could just let go of the. I mean, you could let go of the color thing. 
Yeah, I agree. I mean, look, and that would be a loss of control. I mean, that would be. Yeah. And we're an artistic, quote unquote, artistic town. Let's let our business owners have license to make the sign that they think expresses their business on six square feet. I think we're going to come out really good here, and I think it's going to really we've done that. We've done that. I, I don't think we've ever turned down a business owner right. in terms of the design of the sign yeah. or the colors that were used. Good. Then we don't need to review. I think. I don't feel on that. But we'll see what staff comes back with. I don't know why I did this, but I, I still worry about the guy that comes in with a bike for an hour or something. I mean, you know, it may happen. I mean, it may happen. You know, yeah. I mean, what are you going to do? Then, then you have to tell him to take it down. No. <coughs> no, I mean, that's the thing. If you say that they're exempt, if we got to complain we can, about somebody's sign, we're not going to have to be subjected to say that that sign requires work. You could, exactly you, right. could, yeah. you, could yeah. you could say no fluorescent yeah. colors. Mm -hmm. you, you can allow all colors, but not fluorescent. Yeah. Because it blows in the dark. Thank you. 
did was in order for any of these policies to change, staff is going to have to go back and make some new modifications with the direction we give them, and then we'll revisit it and we'll have to do the approval model again. So I think giving them direction takes out our plate and throws it square into their gap. So, uh, the window frames. So, windows are a little more complicated. Um, if you look at you guys can also see my phone. If you look at Marvin's website, they have a really good explanation of a true divider light, which is wood between each piece of glass. <coughs> that version is no longer made, like Deborah said, except in a clad window made by Lowe. That's got aluminum cladding on the exterior, but it's made of wood, and the aluminum is painted as the color. For one custom. For a custom, exactly. But what Marvin does make is what's called a simulated divide light, divide light with a spacer bar. So that looks like that. So that's wood to the outside of the glass and then inside of the spacer bar. Now nobody can tell, nobody would be able to tell the difference yeah, yeah. of that from a true divide light. So I think that's an acceptable solution for our business, and Marvin does that. And it's called a Marvin window uh, with spacer bar. That would be acceptable. I think the question that I have, which I don't know where people are going to stand on this, is I've built a lot of wooden windows. To make them really last, you have to put them on a little bit of a seat. These type of carving windows are generally made fur and pine, and they don't last very well unless the paint is like that very, very well. I would recommend that we adopt a policy that does allow aluminum cladding on true divider type windows. Um, Mainly, but mainly because I think it's sort of irresponsible to keep using old growth um, to build windows out. Talking myself out of the job, we will apply windows every year. Um, so here's, here's the problem we did in this group uh, around windows earlier. Mm -hmm. And when you say aluminum clad, you're sort of opening up to everything. There, there's really cheap looking aluminum clad. And there's really good aluminum clad, but not with the true divider light. To my knowledge, there are no cheap aluminum windows that have a true divider light. Aluminum clad. So we went to um, the Blair House, I can't remember his name. He proposed the aluminum clad. He ordered one to see what it was like, and that was on display for the board. It looked cheap. And what we decided was that we would go on a case by case basis. If someone wanted to propose an aluminum clad window, they would have to have a sample, a sample and we would have to see it either thumbs up or thumbs down. Mm -hmm. And that's reasonable. That's, that's what we had um, before. It, it's written in the code that they have to be good, true, divided, but we decided that we couldn't. You could open up and say, go ahead and do a little clap. It just seems too ridiculous. There is also, just to piggyback on that, there is description in you know in the annals of the design guidelines that say that you can, you know, maybe case by case and use other materials. Like it says that we have the ability to do that. One of the examples that was gonna come up and then they ended up pulling it was the behind Dick's place. That like they were like this is an example of where an aluminum clad window will just last so much longer and it's not seen by anybody. Like it will still, I think they were wooden windows, but they had the they had the the clad part. And so they ended up withdrawing that because they just wanted the permit to go through. But that was an example of like it seems like this would be a reasonable usage of that. Okay, so on a case by case basis, we will allow them. Yeah, I I, I think there's there's also more of the material there that it has to look. And, you know, the, the, the framework has to be covered. And in the flare has to be a small So it just can't be a square window. It has to have a look to it as well, for sure. So it takes one case of right. So we have people argue that you can't use a real bit for the reason you just said. People argue that you should because that's the way you are built the past. So we were it's just an exception. I mean, no, you, it's, you know, I think. I think that as time goes by, the technology is going to get better, and it's going to look better as we go. But I think at this point, I don't, I don't feel comfortable saying 
open it up. I think we need it case by case. If you really want something that doesn't conform, bring us a sample. Okay. And then if it looks passable by the majority of us. So is that is that the way the code currently written? Because my understanding has been you just can't use it if it's above with the windows I through think, by light. I sound. think all these right where we have the ability to use other materials. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, it is always your choice to approve something. The guidelines are there as truly guidelines, and they say what is considered to be acceptable and not acceptable. And wood windows have been what's been considered acceptable and what's specified in the design guidelines. Sorry. Well, that answers your question. Well, no, I, I guess the question was specifically attached to the window piece. Is there something that says, but if you want something different, you can come forward, or is it just a general rule? I think what she's saying, what our director is saying is that it's, these are guidelines. Yeah, it says. And then if, if someone, if someone comes and they, they give us a good enough case and we agree with it, we can override those guidelines, but we own it. So but like, my question is more about, if the guidelines are the first paragraph of what is a whole bunch of requirements, yeah. then, you know, somebody's going to know that. I mean, because have people come in and say, well, you've got to have wood windows. Whereas if attached to the piece that talks about wood windows, there's actually a specific set see the beginning paragraph where you can use guidelines. That would make it clearer. So I'll just read you the section on windows and doors. It says the proportions and relationships between windows and doors and of each to the structure as a whole shall be compatible with the architectural style and character of landmark structures and with surrounding structures within the historic district. Metal or plastic frames are not acceptable. Shutters should be conspicuous as possible. Raw aluminum combination store windows or doors and plastic and temporary coverings are not acceptable. Windows and doors may have accent or ornamentation when it is integral to the building design. And then below that, there's part A and B speaks to A speaks to residential and says windows are typically tall, double hung wood frame windows. Dormers, boreal bay, bow, and small accent windows are common. Wood panel and wood car doors are appropriate. Single pane picture windows, horizontal awning windows, sliding windows, and windows with horizontally oriented panes are not appropriate. No doors and sliding glass doors are unacceptable. And then for commercial, it speaks about display windows. So, I think so, that's so, what so, so my point is, if I was if I was looking to put some windows in, I'd look at the guidelines and I would say I can't do that. And that's not really what our intent is. Right. Did the guidelines are written before the little and slide windows? No, I, I understand. I'm just saying that there's yeah. nothing in that paragraph. If I was just doing windows, I wouldn't read the whole thing. I would read that and say, I can't do this. And, and the we're, what we're really saying is, if you give us a good case, we might waive this. And I, I'd like to see And there it. is that written. That is written. But it's not written right, right there. It's not written. That's, right. that's, that's my point. So, right. so what, if, what if we have to modify it to say that windows that simulate, sufficiently simulate a true divided light wooden window will be considered by the board? The question is can, what, what does it take to modify that language? Yeah, that's the oh, okay. amendment. I'm sorry? The LCP amendment. Oh, what? Local coastal program amendments. Oh, it's it's worse than like it, it requires a yeah. act of Congress. Oh my God! But I, I think what we can do is we can encourage. I there's. I work not. It's all the architects. I mean, you can encourage see, applicants to only come from staff. Because staff will be looking at their guidelines, and we have to advise folks that we have not yet seen that approved okay. so within the town. Okay. So, okay. Kelly Brown, this is a big sort of. I'll bring a case. I'll bring, it, I'll bring a case before you guys with a project, case project. We have a low and low. Once it's been approved once, then the town will be able to approve it. So I'm going to catch up. Kelly Grimes has been pushing this a long time. And like I said, he was, he was our detective for the, <coughs> at the uh, warehouse. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 same, the same thing with behind Dick's. And our, the there's one that seemed more appropriate to the line between both of them. All right. So. Okay, so I think we should be able to run away with that. We're going to do a case by case basis. But, the, so, so the, the applicant has to understand that they can do that. Right. And they, they, we can't I, 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 Somebody has, but some of the, you also see people coming back to the public and saying, look, this paragraph says you've got to have more windows. What are you guys doing? And my point is that that isn't really true because they're guidelines. But it isn't clear in that paragraph. And 
I understand it's very, very difficult to change that paradox, so I'm looking for a way to make sure everybody understands it. Is it anyone and I will take case? I think staff can handle the applications when they come to them. You guys have had requests before you that showed alternative windows. Yeah. Yeah. They haven't been approved, but there has been requests before. Yeah. Um, and so I think, you know, staff could do like we have done where we say, you know, that doesn't appear to be consistent. We may condition the, make a recommended condition that they be switched out to wood. And you guys can decide how you act upon those going forward. Okay. Okay, are we good on that one? Yeah. I think so. I think we're still going to get that paragraph. We're still going to need to do this over there. Okay. Okay. As, as we will, as we should. <coughs> Or is that being something that staff is doing? No. Thank you. No. 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 It's, it's going to be a, Thank you. It, it, a person by person education. Yeah. If that was a regular question, right, we'll then they can do that and we'll look at it case by case. Thank you. Okay. Uh, 10E exterior landscaping. Yeah. I, again, I, I kind of think that exterior landscaping just should not be the purview of historical review. I don't see why we're looking at whether people have a planter box or put down a little bit of pet pavers or a second so, so can, you, can you remind us the code what, what it says that we have jurisdiction over? It, it, this came out of our meet when we went to that one meeting and there was a whole bunch of little things like yeah, these planter yeah. boxes, these buckets, you know, it's like, I don't think that's should be our job. So 20.760 050A5 sidewalks of brick, flagstone, or board are allowed. Driveways of grass, gravel, or turf stone. Pavers are allowed. Major coverage of front yard setbacks it is prohibited. That speaks to driveways. Um, number four, fences should be made of wood, iron, or plant materials. That speaks to retaining walls. And I think we're looking for where is it required standards there. So like we have in here, it talks about 20.760030, work in historical zone A requiring approval. Walkways and driveways are called out right there. Fences and exterior dividing walls. You have uh, outdoor lighting, outdoor advertising signs. Uh, places I was asking about this today and, and said, is it because of the permeability? No, it's because you guys are, it states that you must review those unless it meets an exemption. And so, the, sorry, the last one I was just going to read is it's landscaping in excess of six feet in height is what you also have reviewed. Ah, that's a height And so then, so the way the code works is it's basically process of um, elimination here too. If you're in historical zone A and your activity is not listed as an exempt type of activity, and it's an exterior alteration, you need an HRB approval. So if I plant a tree that's four foot tall, yet it's expected to go 40 feet in its lifetime, that's exempt, right? Because it's not six feet. Does it say? <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying, right? Does it say if I plant it four feet and it's not six feet, it says six feet in code. If you had a small shrub, I guess, or something like that. But if I have a tree that's under six foot, when I plant it, in theory, no. In theory, yes, you'd be exempt. Even though it's going to grow to 40 feet? In theory, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, I, I know that it mentions driveways and walkways, and that I can see, but all exterior alterations are, are, are mentioned in that? Well, you have per the review board has purview over all exterior alterations unless it's exempt. Um, what are the exempt ones? The exempt ones? <laughs> oh, I'm in the right spot. Yeah, so there's, um, let's see, it's A through O in the listing. So you have detached accessory structures, not more than 120 square feet. And there's a height limitation to that that are made of wood and harmonious. The character lead to fire storage structures. Um, also, with some restrictions, routine maintenance of existing structures. Wait, 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 you, just, you just said you can build a shed exempt? Yeah. yeah. It's under 120 square feet. And made of wood. In the town of Minnesota? Yeah. Correct. Multiple. Yeah. Right here. 760 <laughs> Wait a second. That doesn't jive with anything that I've run into over the years where they're talking. I mean, 
lot coverage issues where we're, you know. Oh, you still have to be lot coverage. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's like from everything else, which means you don't need an HRP permit. You still have to comply with some of these standards. Okay. Which is where you get the lot coverage limitations, height limitations, setbacks. Okay, so those buildings, you, if you have if you have an empty lot, you can build a, 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 a ten. Yeah, you might need a coastal development permit to do it, but conceptually, yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and then you have also the routine maintenance, like I was saying, where the materials match existing, wood construction decks, less than 100 square feet, less than 30 inches high on the grade, uh, fences, less than 6 feet in height made of wood, temporary signs, I won't go through all of those, special purpose signs, there's six of those, also not going to go through those. So do we have to your stitch number hanging pots? But it doesn't talk about landscaping. Yeah, so no, she did write it no. down. Landscaping is what is covered six. underneath work and historical zoning requiring approval. And it's K. Okay. It says any construction related to landscaping in excess of six feet in height. So the structure. Structure. I thought you said landscaping. Any construction related to landscaping in excess of six feet in height. Any construction. Yeah, okay. But that's not, I mean, that's that's not landscaping is putting in. Trees and lawns, and I mean, that's clearly not within our purview. Low retaining walls, that kind of stuff, are not part of our. If you were putting in like a hedge or something like that, would you include That's not the construction. Well, I don't know so that the hedge that's under six foot is exempt. Yes. What about two foot tall retaining wall? Exempt. Okay. Well, is it? As long as the materials are appropriate. Uh, okay. What is it constructing? What is it constructing? The center of the will not construction. No. No. It would not. It takes it. That's weird. Yeah, it's clear as mud. Yeah. Okay. For the comment, I would like to just reiterate what the director just mentioned about conceptually, this is a list of things that are required or exempt from Mendocino Historical Review Board review. It may spur the zoning regulations, it may spur building requirements, may be required for retaining walls that are too deep tall. But that's true for everything. We're just talking yes. about what, what, hits, what hits us versus planning requirements for building. Yes. Hanging pots in the right-of-way of the jurisdiction of the Department of Transportation is not in Planning and Buildings Preview. It is in the Department of Transportation's preview, as mentioned, with wine barrels parked in the street. Okay, that's not our purview. No, no, it's not. So, I, no. I guess the point is that if somebody, I, and we looked at this, whether the guy had the pot to that side, yeah. right six foot, and they, somebody complained about the landscape, and we were looking at the landscape, that says that they can do that. It also says they could well, grow yeah. a hedge, grow a hedge up to six it, it, it says that it's not under our purview. And it, yeah, I don't know it can or can't do it, but it's not under our purview. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I misspoke. Yeah. Yeah. They can't because I don't think that it's under the building purview. Well, it, but it's not under our purview. But that's not our concern. Yeah, it's not our purview. But it says landscape construction. Yeah, that's not our purview. 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 Yeah, Although I just feel bad for staff, because staff is having to, and they have to go and look <coughs> there. Yeah, uh, the, the thing that I'm still wrapping my mind around is like the temporariness of these things. Yeah. You know, like hanging, like, uh, like the heaters. You know, the heaters were a temporary, in in the the yeah. They are very temporary. I mean, I don't, those aren't very, that's, that's a bad example. Fences, <laughs> like fences are exempt for walkways on in the way that this is working out. Correct. So if you want to build a fence, you can build a fence as long as it's under six foot tall. But you can't put down flagstone pavement without coming before the storm. Yeah. You know, and that's why yeah, there is a lot of. That's a lot. Well, pavers are permeable, right? Well, depending on this one. Well, and there's still. Again, there's certain items that are required to come in front of the review board, and if it's not an exemption for the sidewalks and pathways and such, then that comes before you. Right. All right. So then you just Absent amending the LCP, 
the local coastal program to actually change what your authority is, exemptions, and what requires a permit. That's really the only way to get it on that. Do, do you know our board members have the buyer of the code? Um, somewhere, I think. Yeah. It's also available online in a searchable format. Yeah, I, I tried to look for some of that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I have a super quick question that would have been a matter from board members. Is it possible to get a link to some of that stuff or people to like that? I would agree with that because yeah. I, I struggled with the, uh, the signage thing. It's yeah. the yeah. entire, what you're going to get a link to is the entire sign code, but then we'll link you to the, the I yeah. I, 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 so I just couldn't get started. started. Well, yeah. no, I mean, it's not, it's tabbed out, but it's yeah. just like there's no way to separate it. If you send it out, it's in the phone. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Good question. Someone asked me about a statue have it come before us for the statue. Oh, we had that discussion. We had century I wasn't building. sure how, yeah, I, I mentioned to them the, those are the structures to hold this. This is, I told them to reach out to the property owner where they would be interested in placing the statue and the property owner would bring that forward. That's the best direction. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I think better all the way. If I make it more. So if I wanted to put a statue, if anybody wanted to put a statue on your property, yeah. there would be um, the the if the if a permit would be required through an HRB, there would be an agent authorization form that the landowner would allow the statue yeah. installer okay. to do the appropriate work. Um, okay. we, what what authorization? It's it's basically an agent authorization yeah. form. So we have that in all of our forms where um, you know, uh, Kelly Grimes has his clients sign that every every application that he brings in front of you is an agent authorization form. And so it would be just one of those forms um, that's in the application that they would get the landowner's approval. And I think it depends probably on the height of the height. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah it's less than six feet in height or taller than six feet in height because I would say a statue is very really likely in that landscaping category. Less than six feet in height or Thank you. 